The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. All right, everybody, welcome to the Steve Austin Show. I am coming to you from the Main Street of Los Angeles, California. I'm sitting here in my office with Hershey the Wonder Dog laying on the floor directly in front of me. I'm sitting at my table, just finished a cup of coffee, hit the record button on my Zoom H4N. My trusted pearl beer neon clock is sitting right beside me. Yellow neon tube, I had it replaced, it was blue. The red second hand is spinning around like a rotisserie chicken, as it always does. Before I get cranked up, rocking and rolling today, I wanted to give a couple of shout-outs to a couple of people who were inspired by the show and are going through some tough times and overcame a few of the issues that they were in. So anyway, before I get cranked up and start telling you guys some stories, and I also got another email which is going to tell you what the podcast is about that I'm covering today. But I want to give a shout-out to Juliana. She listens to the show, and she overcame uh, a lot of things to do a lot of good things and uh, is about to uh, graduate from college, overcome a whole lot. And, uh, Juliana, thank you for sending me the email. Congratulations on all your hard work and everything that you've uh, persevered through. And I also wanted to give a shout-out over to Jason. And uh, Jason was fired up to hear that uh, I'm working on a project with Cold Steel Knives. He's a big fan of Cold Steel, and Jason's uh, undergoing some uh, rough things in his life. So, Jason, uh, wish you all the best of luck, and uh, thank you for sending uh, your letter into the email just giving you a shout out to say I appreciate you uh, sending the email and good luck to you, and uh, I'm glad that the show could uh, could help you, and I'm glad you're excited about the uh, the knife with Cole still as I am too. And uh, with that being said, with those two shout outs being made, and I didn't want to go too specific into who uh, these people are and what they're going through. Nonetheless, I want to give them uh, the, the shout out and the props. But I got a letter here at questions at steveaustinshow dot com. And guy writes in to me and he says, hey, Steve, how are you? Love the pod. I was watching a YouTube compilation of some of the biggest pops in history. And number one was when you came out during the Mankind versus Rock title match on Raw many moons ago. Do you have any recollection of that and how loud it was? It's loud as hell just listening on my computer. So I can't fathom how loud it would have been in real life. Truly amazing to see. You come out around the 10 minute and 50 second mark. Keep up the great work. Swig a beer, Zach. Now, here's what I did. He gives me a link to the match that he's mentioning. And I would basically forgotten about this match. But it's on Daily Motion. And it's WWF Raw is War 4-1-1999. The Rock versus Mankind for WWE Championship Sport. That's what it says on the link. Nonetheless, Zach, you're asking me, you know, how I remembered that pop or how loud was it? Was that the loudest pop uh, I'd ever gotten in uh, all the entrances that I made? And so, you know, I clicked on the link. I went to the match. Here comes Mankind. Here comes The Rock. Here comes a lot of other players. I'm fixing to break this match down is what I'm fixing to do. And so I briefly watched this match, a part of it, and then I just slid a little uh, marker down to about 10 minutes and 30 seconds and uh, started watching the match because the time cue was 10.50 once when I was going to make my appearance and hear the pop. And all I was going to do was listen to how loud the pop was and then go back and answer Zach and, you know, leave it alone. Just go on down the road, answer his question. But then I said, you know what? That was an astronomical pop. And why was that pop so damn loud? So I figured, you know what? Let me go back to the beginning of the match from start to finish and watch how this uh, pop happened, why it was so great. But then as I started watching the match between The Rock and Mankind, Mick Foley, was so off the charts good, I just had to break this match down. So that's what I'm going to do for you. The match is almost 15 minutes long from start to finish, and that's with some entrances, and that's with a a long close at the back end, a little bit of promo work. But this was just an outstanding match, and so I'm going to break that down for you 
give you my thoughts on all the work that was done in the ring that night by both guys who were super over. And that's going to be the podcast today. It was uh, just a badass match, and that's why I'm going to break it down for you because it goes to show how simple the business can be. But I'm going to give you all the things to look for that maybe you didn't look for which, which I noticed in the match, and how these guys played their part so well. And uh, I'll also be giving props to Earl Hebner. This is a no-disqualification match. Earl Hebner's a referee that actually employs some use of the rules in the match. And so sometimes, as I've done that in the past as well, it just makes the stakes seem all that much higher. And watch how uh, Earl is uh, distracted in such a... Uh, he's so good at the distractions to never bury himself or to put heat uh, on himself. And then watch the, the two double blind feeds given by The Rock. One to Mr. Sacco provided by Mick Foley. I'll elaborate about that whole gimmick and that finish move while I break that down. Also watch the blind feed to the steel chair supplied by me. Great timing, great trust, great uh, blind feeds, which is almost a lost art to, uh, these days. But nonetheless, that's what I'm breaking down uh, today on the show, just because Zach sent in this match. It was all about my pop, and we'll talk about that pop. But we'll talk about how and why that pop happened. And it was due in large part to everybody who surrounded that ring. Everybody who surrounded that ring was damn near a Hall of Famer or will be in the Hall of Fame by the time it's said and done. Rock and Mick worked their asses off, told a hell of a story, great pacing, great work. The fans were totally invested, and all the guys played key parts. Shamrock comes in with a stiff chair. Anyway, let's not break that down now. I'll break it down when I come back uh, from the uh, main part of this show. But right now, man, I want to say swig of water to Todd, Todd C. from the Broken Skull Challenge this past Sunday. My God, what an absolutely epic performance this young man turned in on the Skull Buster. You talk about a superhuman effort. This cat left everything he had on the damn obstacle course. That Skull Buster picked him apart piece by piece, and by the time he came down Heartbreak Hill, he was 19 seconds ahead of N, who was able to crank out a 639 and send Tommy Hackenbrook stepping down the road. And all of a sudden, man, before he gets to the rope burn, the very last obstacle, obstacle number 10, he goes up Heartbreak Hill. And he's given it every single thing he has. And to come down, he just, instead of just going side by side or sliding down like he's sliding in the second base, third base, second base, third base, he tumbles down like a tumbleweed almost as fast as you could run down. It was absolutely incredible the, second, the sacrifice this guy was trying to make to beat that time. And I tell you what, they kept putting the camera on in, and in was like, man, he was calm and cool and composed. But you could see he knew Todd was doing something special. He knew that Todd was uncorking one monster effort here. What a time! And executing with precision, he was in danger of going home. Oh my God! Todd got to within three feet of that damn bell, and he climbed the first six feet. Legs free. He had just armed his way up there. And all of a sudden, with about three feet left to go, just come sliding down. And over three seasons, I've seen that look of desperation. I've seen their muscles just freeze up. The fatigue sets in. The grip starts to loosen. The skull buster has picked apart every piece of their body, has gotten into their mind. Everything they have is burning. You're discombobulated, and you don't know what's going on. You just know that the next step that you need to take, that next pull up the rope, is almost impossible. And it was for Todd. After a valiant effort, come sliding down there and then just couldn't give it no more. It's almost like Roberto Duran, no mas. Dude, swig of water. You shelled out and put on a thrill of a show. Man, it was the damnedest skull buster I think I've ever seen run. You didn't beat the skull buster, but you committed so hard. I think, I think he clocked in at about a 5'10", buck 80 
on the weight. I can't remember your stats, Todd. Nonetheless, dude, uh, you earned my respect. I hope to see you down the road real quick. That was some epic TV. Congratulations to Andy. Puts another $10,000 in his pocket. He's a class act and is a hell of a competitor. It's going to take a hell of a man to knock him off the pedestal. So Broken Skull Challenge is on every Sunday, 8, 7 Central, 5 p.m. out here on the West Coast. It's the toughest, coolest, baddest show on television. It's on CMT, and that's the bottom line. Before I go any further, a uh, swig of beer to all my guys and all my gals out there on Redneck Island. Man, we cranked it up this past uh, week and uh, having fun with the kids out there, having fun with my co-host, the wonderful Melissa Rycroft. She's really a pleasure to work with, and we're having a lot of fun every night on that. And Redneck Island, Thursdays, Thirsty Thursdays, along with Party Down South, and it comes on at 10, 9 Central. So check out that if you haven't. The challenges are off the chart. The Rednecks are getting challenged a hell of a lot more than I've ever challenged them. And all of the badass shirts that I'm wearing on both shows are available at ProWrestlingTees.com. All the shirts that you're seeing on Broken Skull Challenge and my line of Swig of Beer SOB shirts about to make its debut on Redneck Island. Those are going to be available at ProWrestlingTees.com. As a matter of fact, I think those are going to be available at ClotheslineTees.com. I will keep you posted when I wear that shirt on the air. Broken Skull IPA continues to sell like hotcakes at El Segundo Brewing. If you're in California, you can find it at Whole Foods, Total Wine, and InsideTheCellar.com. You're listening to another classic episode of The Steve Austin Show, only on Podcast One. All right, look, we all know that change doesn't happen without action. Whether you're looking for gains at the gym or a better experience in the bedroom, there's never any shame in showing up for yourself and your health. So if you're dealing with PE, don't ignore the issue and instead face it head on with Roman. Roman swipes are clinically proven to help you last longer in bed. And guess what? There's no prescription required. PE treatments are safe, effective, and used by millions of men. Plus, you get free two-day shipping so it can get to you in a hurry. Guys, you'll take protein to help you with the gains in the gym. You'll even eat the right foods. We'll do anything to help any aspect of our lives. Why wouldn't you do something to show up for yourself in the bedroom? If this sounds like a no-brainer to you like it does to me, go to GetRoman.com slash Austin today. And if you're approved, you'll get $10 off your first order. That's GetRoman.com slash Austin. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. I want to say thanks to the sponsors who let me do this podcast for you free twice a week. Ain't charging you a damn thing. Family friendly tonight. Explicit content every Thursday, but they're both free. I tell you what, again, I'm breaking down this match because someone sent in an email to me about my pop. But then I watched this match. was so blown away uh, by the two guys who performed in this match and everybody that was attached to it. As most people know, uh, Mick Foley was one of my travel partners way back in the day and a very good friend. As most people know, Rock is one of my favorite opponents of all time and a very good friend. I hold both of these guys in super high regard, love them both to death, and have nothing but the utmost respect for them. So the email came in about my pop, but it was about these guys setting the stage for that pop to happen and for all the guys who would come down from the corporation and DX to set up the pop that I was to get at the 1050 mark of this match. And again, I'm on daily motion, WWF, Raw is War, 4-1-1999, Rock versus Mankind for the WWF Championship. And a swig of beer to one of my favorite referees of all time, Earl Hebner. Uh, A lot of things going on in this match. Uh, Some things to watch before. before. What I'm going to do is I'm going to push the play button. And I'm going to let you listen to both entrances because Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler are laying down the soundtrack on this thing. And this is some of Michael Cole's best work going back to 1999. Now he's still outstanding. He's still awesome, but he has to disperse so much information. This is back when we didn't have all the apps and all the stuff to push and and to talk about so he could focus on the storyline. And he does a hell of a job setting up the stakes uh, you know, Rock being the underdog, Jerry Lawler is fantastic as usual, but he's really on point here. The way they paint Mick in a corner, there's no way he can win this thing. 
And this was done at a time when we were right in the middle of the Monday Night War still. And when we taped this match, uh, this is when we would do a live Raw, and then we would tape the next Raw. And we so that Raw would go to post-production. We were trying to save money. We weren't going live every single week because it cost too much. When this happened, WCW found out the results of the match, and that's when Eric Bischoff dropped the information that, oh, Mankind's going to win the, or Mick Foley's going to win the world championship from The Rock, and who really cares about that? Big mistake. Everybody cares about that. First of all, Mick Foley paid some heavy-duty dues, earned his stripes. Everybody loved him. Also, The Rock was absolutely on fire. He's the heavyweight champion of the world in the major league promotion in the world. All of a sudden, there's going to be a title change on television. That's big news. You know, the fact that it was pre-taped was what it was, but it gave everybody a chance to say, hey, yeah, you give me the results, but I want to see how they switch that belt. So you had two superstars of their magnitude executing an outstanding match with impeccable psychology, great execution, awesome timing with all the distractions, and it's a no-disqualification match. And here's the thing that's so great about this match because Rock and I did a similar thing with respect to uh, a no-DQ match, I think, in WrestleMania 17, where, you know, if someone made it to the ropes, the referee was still making the call to hate to let go. So Earl Hebner is distracted several times uh, by the uh, outside parties, and he's the master at being distracted. So he doesn't put heat on the talent. He doesn't put heat on himself. And, you know, that's that's just uh, very hard to do. So watch a couple of times in this match when Earl's head is turned. Now, again, if it's no DQ, he should be able to see everything. But it's that part of the match where, you know, you put another – it just ups the ante, basically, when you're able to have a no DQ match but also have – the, the leeway or the creative uh, liberty to actually employ some of those rules. Now, the crowd has totally suspended their disbelief, or however you say that correctly, uh, and, and it gives them, it, it just ups the stakes uh, and puts even more pressure on Mick. He comes in as the underdog. They're cheating behind the referee's back, and there'll be a time in here, and I'll, I'll pull your attention to it for a couple of things to watch for in this match. Um uh, for instance, when uh, Rock uses a belt, Earl actually sees the belt come in, but Boss Man pops up at just the right opportunity for that distraction. He turns to Boss Man. Uh, so there's a couple of moments like that. Earl is the master at that. He was so good. And then uh, there's a couple of blind feeds done by The Rock. One, he feeds Mick Foley for Mr. Sacco. And speaking of Mr. Sacco, nobody. I mean nobody but Mick Foley could get... Uh, a thing like a sock over to the degree that he did. I'll never forget when I was uh, about to hit Mr. McMahon in the head with that bedpan, me and uh, Mick Foley were in a bathroom about the size of a shower in the hospital, and he was telling me about the sock, and he was going to start using it as a finish. And we were laughing our asses off in that little bitty bathroom and had to knock on the door and tell us, hey, you guys need to keep it quiet. We're trying to film Vince's part of this skit. So anyway, Swig of beer and big respect for Mick Foley. Getting the mandible claw over was easy. I mean, that was a great finish. But then using the sock and calling it Mr. Socko, that's entertainment. That's something that's just, it's credible. And then you throw the, the showmanship or uh, the, the entertainment factor in it by using the sock, and then the sock turns into a character. Dude, that's just good stuff. I don't care who you are, that's good stuff. So The Rock turns with the blind feed for that, and then also he turns the blind feed for my chair shot. Now, a blind feed is when a guy turns into something without, you know, he's turning blindly into something. He don't know what he's turning into. Well, he does, but it's going to be a mandible claw. It's going to be a chair shot. It's going to be a crossbody uh, from the top turnbuckle. A blind feed is simply feeding into something with your head turned and all of a sudden facing into it. We've all seen some bad ones. If you watch the way Rock executes these two blind feeds awesome timing on one he's feeding the mandible claw mr Sacco. on the on the other one mine he's feeding a steel chair and he does it with trust and he does it without fear he knows i'm gonna take care of him and he trusts me 
and he's also tough. But nonetheless, a blind feed is heading into something that you hope, if it's a high-risk maneuver, that you can trust the other guy to pull it off and not hurt you. His timing is impeccable, and it's awesome. Watch uh, Earl Hebner. Watch the counts during the match. Watch the final three count at the end when he hits the three. There's a little hitch in the uh, if you log on to DailyMotion.com to watch this match. Right when he starts that count, there's a hitch in the tape. But nonetheless, it's very deliberate. It's like a pendulum swing, very deliberate three counts, signifying the magnitude of the change and how uh, final that last three count is. And, you know, both guys were just awesome in this match. So, again, here we go. I'm about to, uh, and I'll tell you other things to look for as well, but I'm going to hit the play button, and I'm going to let Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler set this thing up with their outstanding commentary, and then we'll start getting into the match. And a couple of times I'll say uh, hit the pause button. To you people that are riding down the road going to work, from work, or you're at work, and you're supposed to be working, but you're not, you're listening to my voice, I'm going to talk you through this match so you can visualize it in your head. But when you get back to your uh, computer, your smartphone, your uh, whatever, your iPad or whatever, then you can sync it up and watch it with me, and you'll go through the beats with me. But, again, I know a podcast is audio, and I'm using video. But, nonetheless, I'm going to break it down for you, and I think you can be able to understand exactly what I'm saying. And you can watch this match. Uh, even if you can't sync them up and listen to it simultaneously, you'll know what to look for and how I break it down. Hell of a match. I'm going to hit the play button. Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler will set the stage, and we will go from there. I'll hit pause button several times during the podcast and let it fly. Hey, man, this is the podcast, and it's free. I, You know, there ain't no rules. I do whatever the hell I want to, and that's what we're doing today. It's a badass match. You can probably catch this thing on the WWE Network in a little bit better quality. Nonetheless, here we go. So it's Mankind next on the corporate team. I gotta be real worried. Mankind holding Shane McMahon hostage earlier on, forcing Mr. McMahon to agree to this matchup against The Rock in a no disqualification stipulation. Wait a minute. And, and here, here, here comes DX. Here comes DX. DX is adopted. Mankind is part of the, the family in recent weeks. Oh, this is really getting interesting now. And here is Mankind, Mick Foley. The kid who, who played Cowboys and Indians as a kid. And he said he's always the Indian because he stood up for the underdog. And that's what he is in this matchup, an underdog. He's an underdog not only against you The Rock. You smell what The Rock is cooking. Here's what I'm wondering. Does DX know what happened to Shawn Michaels? Do you think not? I don't know, kid. I don't know what to, to believe. I don't know what to think anymore. There's no disqualification. The Rock against Mankind, and the odds are stacked against Mick Foley. Not only the great athlete, The Rock, but the entire corporation will obviously be at ringside, and there's no disqualification. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm worried because The Rock was not prepared for this match. Look, he still doesn't have his, his wrestling attire on. But he's a champion, King. You should always be ready. The Rock... It's what Mr. McMahon wants a champion to be. But can you imagine if mankind could somehow pull it out and win the championship? Now, come on, listen. I don't even want to imagine it, okay? I mean, look at him. He's a freak. Even Mr. McMahon said he's a genetically altered, mentally deficient freak. Come on, let's face it. He's lost most of his teeth. He's only got one ear. He's pulled out most of his own hair. And that's not even to mention all the thousands of brain cells that he's missing. That gold is the centerpiece of this company. All right, hit the pause button right there. That gold is the centerpiece of this company. You heard it come right out of Michael Cole's mouth. That tells you how important that god dang heavyweight championship belt is. If you ain't in the business to be the heavyweight champion of the world, you got no business being there because that's what you're all shooting for. And here's the thing. When I got into business, I didn't... 
I didn't think I was ever going to be the world champion, but I stuck with it long enough, got enough breaks, ended up being a world champion six times. That belt is a work, but it's a damn shoot. And here's the thing. You're trying to establish, you're trying to present something that is basically a shoot. You're presenting this like this is a sporting event. This is professional wrestling. Hell with sports entertainment, man. He's telling you right now that gold is the centerpiece of the WWE. It is, and that's a shoot. I like the way Michael Cole uh, rang that home, and that's the bottom line. Everything's on the line. He's building up. He's done said that uh, The Rock is definitely the favorite. He's the champion. He's got all the athletic ability. Mankind is a little bit on the freakish side, according to Jerry Lawler. He's the underdog. He's been the underdog his whole life since he was a kid, and he's fighting against the odds. They've got everything set against Mick Foley. There's no way that he could win this match. But if he were to win this match, what a nightmare that would be for Vince McMahon because The Rock is everything that Vince McMahon wants the world champion to be. So all of a sudden, we're at a little bit of a break here. If you watch uh, Mick Foley make his entrance down that uh, ramp, and I'm at 2 minutes and 28 seconds right here. That's where I'm paused at. He comes down. He's got a great reception from the crowd. He goes into the ring, and he just has this kind of this look on his face. He's definitely playing a part of the underdog, and he puts a couple of little you know head shakes, head ticks in there. And you wonder, okay, what's going through this guy's mind? And, you know, he knows the task at hand. Here comes the rock. They hit that music. And here comes the confidence and the swagger. And he has the corporation behind him. And Mick Foley sees the strength in numbers. Now you have DX all alongside uh, of the apron as well. And DX is hotter than a firecracker. China is super over. She looks fantastic at ringside. Their pieces are in play. Now here comes down to corporation with Ken Shamrock, the most dangerous man in the world, big boss man, and the rest of the gang, Shane, Tess, Andrew Martin, who's no longer with us, boss man is no longer with us. But I tell you what, that that music hits from The Rock, and it's on. And this is really some of the the Rock was always a damn good worker. This is when he was a great worker. He come in a little bit green, and all of a sudden he got really, really good and got great. Right now, he's a full confidence, full swagger, and he's he's starting to become so entertaining. He has a large faction of people that like him, but still, because he's so true to his nature here of being a heel, and he's a vicious heel, and he's very uh, physically imposing, he does still have some people that do not like him. But he's almost a tweener here, but still yet more on the heel side. And he plays that to perfection in this match. So I'm going to hit the play button again. I'm going to turn the volume down on the uh, monitor, and I'll take you through what happens during the match. Notice when Rock goes up, he holds that championship belt high in the air, and then he kind of teases Earl with it, and Mick gives him plenty of space. He gives him space, lets him do his thing, and Earl is about to ring the bell. I am at 2 minutes and 28 seconds. I'm hitting the play button now. Okay, here we go. I'll turn this up one notch so I got something to go off of. Okay, now the Mick Foley's going to look between the ropes there to get look at the belt. There's Mr. Man. Rock jump starts him from behind, from behind. Man, okay, a great position by Mick. Watch where Mick is all... Right between the second and third rope, nice bump back onto the apron between the second and third. Rock putting the boots to him. He's going to roll out. Here comes Shamrock. Shamrock's going to try to get on him. Gives him a kick. Rock steps in, says, hey, man, let me do this by myself. I've got it. He's asserting himself as the alpha male. Notice the way Mick keeps himself open for Rock to get his stuff in. Let me turn this back down. Okay, Rock takes him to the table, but Mick blocks it, gives it back to Rock. Okay, now, Mick back on the offensive. Watch the aggressive hands. Good punches by by Mick. Now he's biting the rock. Rock's selling like crazy. People on the front row going crazy. Good working punches by Mick Foley. Vicious. He's not rushing anything here. Not rushing. Rock walks away from him, getting ready for another little gig here. Okay, outside the ring, Earl Hebner trailing the action. He goes to send Rock into the staircase. There's a reversal. Mick with a sick-ass bump over those damn steps. Let me hit the pause button right here. I'll tell you what. Let's talk about these steps. These days, 
in if you're watching the pay-per-view on the WWE Network, you'll see these stairs come into play probably two, three, four times on a card. Back in the day, the steps were always a, a prop, but now everybody just wants to ram their shoulders into them. And believe me, trust me when I tell you, when you get thrown into those steps, they hurt. And depending on how hard you ram your shoulder in, because it's a very competitive environment, everybody wants to hit those stairs harder than the person before them. And to show that you're not a sissy, everybody attacks the stairs. Mick takes a glancing blow off the top, exposing himself to the corners there and the danger of being cut open or just, you know, just a hard corner into part of his body. Takes a wonderful bump over to the other side, but that's a physical bump. Now, what's fixing to happen is Rock's going to pick up those stairs. Those stairs are made out of aluminum, but they're heavy gauge aluminum. When you pick them stairs up, man, that top layer, you're probably looking at 60, 80 pounds, but it's hard to control. And let's put the let's push the play button. He's fixing to crash these stairs on Mick's back. Then uh, the stairs will fall across Mick's body, and he uses the other stairs to deliver another crushing blow to those stairs. Hey, man, you might just think, oh, he's just hitting the stairs. No, the lip of those stairs is on Mick Foley's body. Believe me. You've got to be, well, let me just say this. Do not try this at home. Let me stop rambling and telling you how dangerous these stairs are, and let's get on with this badass match by two badass performers. Okay, here we go. Rock with a couple of kicks to the head. I'll hit one notch on my volume button. Good punches by the Rock. Ken Shamrock, the most dangerous man in the world. That's one thing I always respected about Ken. He was so giving in the ring to be so dangerous. Okay, here's Rock. Big way up. You could hear the thud there when Rock crushed Mick with those stairs. Believe me, that'll take the wind out of your sails. Now he's got the bottom section. He hits the top section. It's only on Mick's trapezius on his neck. Great facials by Vince McMahon. Kane right behind him, the monster. Shows the replay. You can hear the impact go into the vertebrae of Mick Foley. Then the chairs across on the top. Almost, uh, oh, Mankind first became WWE Hardcore Champion. There's a graphic on the uh, air. Okay, Rock inflicting damage to Mankind. You're going to give him a snap suplex here at the 4 minute 53 mark. Boom, with a lot of force. Good snap on that suplex. I'm going to turn the volume back down. Okay, here's Rock. He's going to get on the horn and talk a little bit of trash. Obviously, he's just checked Mankind in to the SmackDown Hotel on the corner of Know Your Road Boulevard and Jabroni Drive. Maybe a little thirsty, Mankind. He wants some water here. Okay, so that's one of Rock's favorite gimmicks is to get a drink of water while he's having a match. That's what I used to always do when I used to get underneath the, the announcer's table there. Right when he's going to spit the water on the rock, Mick hits him with a big right hand, starts firing away with very vicious right hands. Great fire by Mick Foley. Well, Mankind, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. Throws him in. Okay, now Mick's going to get on a headset. Mankind's looking real good. Yeah. yeah look. kid's showing a lot of testicular force. Testicular. Well, let's listen. listen. Bing. Rock just lambasted, blindsided mankind with the ring bell. You heard it ring the bell. As Jim Ross would say, he rang his bell. Hell of a headshot. He trusted the Rock. Rock laid it in like he had to. Now he's choked him with the cord, hits him with the fan. He's doing damage. You can't see this anymore because they won't let you use an extension cord to choke anybody. A little call here. He's putting him up on the announce table now. Rock's selling it perfectly, giving the crowd time to buy in, to seeing what the setup is. Here we go. I'm going to push the pause button right now. All right, I'm going to hit the pause button right now and talk to you about these tables. Now, most of us in the business of pro wrestling have been through a table or two in our time. Now, here's the thing. While seemingly, you know, most time a table will break the way you expect it to, that's not a guarantee. So anything could happen. I hit the pause button right before Rock was to set up to give Mick Foley the rock bottom on the announce table. Now, understand this. Everybody always removes the monitors out of there before they do a big bump. That's because those things have sharp edges, and if they hit your head, they will cut you and hurt you and damage you. So 
anyway, uh, they've left pretty much everything intact, and they're at a position where seemingly Mick's going to hit the sweet spot of that table in the center and go to the ground. Don't get me wrong, man. When those tables break, you've still got a man that weighs 270 pounds, and the guy working with him weighs 270 pounds, and the boat fixed to come crashing through the cement. There's a pad there on the cement, but you're coming from, you know, a state of elevation and a downward driving force. Laws of physics and gravity and speed come into play here right on to Mick Foley's back and his body. This is a hellacious move, and it's a risky move. So if you just think it's a rock bottom on a table, it is much more than that. Let's hit the play button. We'll see what happens. Boom! Big impact. Mick hits the table pretty damn square. It's a pretty good bump. Looks like it was a pretty good land. Let's hit the volume up one notch. Let's take it back down. Pandemonium. Here's the replay. Almost textbook, but, man, it goes kind of cattywampus over there towards the end. You don't know how Mick has really landed. Could have damaged his shoulder. When you hit these steel chairs or those folding chairs behind the table, it's like when Booker T uh, put me through the tables uh, in uh, Meadowlands, New Jersey, many years ago. I broke three vertebrae on my back on the chairs that were behind that table. It wasn't Booker's fault. Okay, let's go back to the match. Okay, watch the way Mick has positioned himself. 7-11 mark on your TV. 7-11 mark. Boom, he comes back up to a vertical base only to be knocked down. Watch what hit the pause button at 7 minutes and 19 seconds. What Mick was doing there on a total sell job kept himself open on his knees for the rock to have an open target to attack him somehow staggered up to a vertical base just to make the downward bump from being on his feet greater than just coming from his knees spectacular sell job by mcfoley spectacular timing by the rock to let him come to his feet because he knew he was going to knock him down goes for the cover i'm hitting the play button at the seven minute 19 second mark play one two okay watch those ambidextrous counts by earl hebner right or left hand depending on which hand he slides in on the action Okay, no disqualification, just heard it. He's got Mick on the ropes, facing away from hard camera. He draws Earl Hebner. Here comes Shane for the choke job on Mick Foley. Seemingly, no disqualification. There was an infraction in the rules. Rock drew Earl Hebner. Okay, side rushing leg sweep. As called by Michael Cole. One, two, left hand. Might just be me. I think, I'm think i thinking uh, Earl Hebner may be left-handed. Okay, goes to throw Mick into the turnbuckle. Big right hand by the rock. He's going to send him into the other side. Both guys covering up their covers. Mick takes a turnbuckle. Rock charges in, meets an elbow from Mick Foley. Boom! Mick Foley basically just crashes into him. The impact sends the rock to the canvas. Rock on back. Rock backpedaling now. Mick is on fire, making a little bit of a comeback. Sends rock in. Reversal. Mick takes an elbow, feeds in for the big power slam right in the middle of the ring. Here it is. Push the pause button. Eight minutes, 32 seconds. Eight minutes, 32 seconds. Mick sent Rock in. Rock reversed it. Caught the elbow. Mick caught the elbow and then fed up into a scoop slam center of the ring. The Rock is standing directly over Mick Foley. This is the part where you go from pro wrestling to the entertainment aspect of it. He does the signal for the people's elbow. And he plays it so perfectly here. He doesn't bury Mick by leaving him laying there too long. He has the showmanship uh, there for the crowd. And then watch the finishing touch after he hits the one rope, hits the other rope. He does a little jaw jack routine where he mimics Mick Foley talking with Mr. Sacco and delivers the vicious elbow. That's entertainment. But he follows it up with that shoot elbow and so he just, he doesn't bury Mick. He hits him with a great elbow, and he throws that great entertainment factor in there, which is premier. Let's hit the play button. Watch how he pulls this off. Watch how he executes it with perfection and never buries Mick, never leaves him hanging, and gets his stuff in, as we say in the business, with an entertaining flair that would make him the most electrifying man in the history of the business. Play at 832 now. 
Okay, Earl Hebner out of the way, just watching what's going on there. Rock with a big signal, goes hit this rope, crosses over Mick Mick laying there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bam! Pick up oh, by the Rock. Vince McMahon is very happy. There's Kid Shamrock. Good cover by Rock. Good cover by Rock. Hooking to the leg. It could have been over. Road Dog, Jesse James, Triple H, all the gang over there. Sigh of relief. There's Big Billy Gunn. Sean Waltman. Okay, Rock with a big right hand. Rock backs him in, sends him in for the ride. Mick hits the ropes. Ducks the clothesline, comes back. Spinning neck breaker. Mick Foley hits the Rock with the spinning neck breaker. Both guys down. It's a double down. Great sell job by Mick. Look at his outfit. The tattered shirt. The tie. Here comes Mick Foley. Okay, someone's pulling his leg. Someone's pulling his leg. The belt has been slid in. The championship belt has been slid in. Pause. Pause right now. Speaking of pause, I'm going to take a pause for the calls right now. I just hit the pause button. We're at the 9 minute and 27 mark on the match. There's... Five minutes left of this match. I'm coming right back after I take a break for the sponsors to keep this show on the air for free. Right now, in front of me, I've got an El Segundo Steve Austin's Broken Skull IPA glass in my hand. But the beer inside there is from El Segundo Brewing Company, and it's called Standard Crude Swigger Beer. If you get down to El Segundo, 140 Main Street, go get you some of that Standard Crude. It's a, I guess it's a, and it's imperial stout, and it's dark, and get the bourbon barrel stuff. You talk about one hellacious beer. You're listening to another classic episode of the Steve Austin Show, only on Podcast One. Do you own a home or condo? Or perhaps you run a house or apartment? Sure you do, and Geico knows it can be hard work. Because whether you own or rent, you still have to fill it full of your stuff, your furniture, the flat screen and all the boxes of stuff that have been sitting there ever since you moved in, but haven't unpacked. It's hard to find the time, right? But you know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. That way, you'll rest easy knowing that your home and all your stuff is protected, like the furniture and that flat screen. Plus, getting a quote on homeowner's and renter's insurance is super easy through GEICO. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. You know, like going through all those boxes of stuff. Visit Geico.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's Geico easy. Visit Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. Okay, now here we go. Back at it, folks. Now check it out. Let me bring you up to speed with what's happening. I'm at the 9 minute and 27 second mark in the match. What has happened is someone has slid in the championship belt to hit Mick Foley in the head. Earl Hebner actually saw the belt, but he knew that was going to be his cue to be distracted. Luckily, right at the right fraction of time, could have been a little bit sooner, Big Boss Man pops up to draw Earl away. Remember, we're operating under uh, no disqualification. Anything goes. So in theory, this should be legal. It is. It's a nice luxury to have when you're in a no-DQ situation, but you use the rules to help manipulate the crowd to make the stakes higher and the, gosh, I'm searching for words here, to make the odds even tougher for the underdog Mick Foley to overcome. I'm going to hit the play button. We're looking for the belt shot that Rock delivers to the Mick, and it's a solid shot. You can hear that gold belt hit Mick in the skull. And then we'll watch what happens after that. Big swing. Blind feed by Mick. Boom. Rock throws the belt to Big Boss Man. Earl Hebner never saw it. He's back to the right hand now because of the cover. I was thinking he was left-handed there because I was thinking he was ambidextrous. Mick kicks out. Mick kicks out. Okay, both guys. Mick coming up first. Okay, here comes Rock. He's going to take a blind swing. He misses with the belt. Mick kicks him. Bam, DDT, hit the pause button. Okay, Rock took another swing at Mick. Mick ducked it, kicked Rock in the gut, and then it was Rock dropped the belt when he got kicked. The goal there was to DDT Rock on the belt because the belt hitting the head. Well, what happens when Mick sweeps his leg, he actually kicks the belt out of the way, and Rock misses the belt, but none, nonetheless, the effect is still there for the most part. It's a visual. 
and the DDT, you know, on a belt is a DDT on a belt, but he actually sweeps the belt out of the way. Nonetheless, it's a great DDT delivered by Mick and sold outstanding on the backside by Rock. I'm going to hit the play button when Rock kicks out. Now, Rock does a kick out here with both eyes open, looking back at Earl, and that's fine. I'm a, it's, that's a 50-50 type thing. I've always been the kind of guy that when someone has given me something of impact that has rendered me somewhere close to being pinned, I like to use my eyes closed or keep my eyes closed, and I'm relying on the cadence of the ref to be steady to time my kick out just to draw the audience in, whoever, uh, because I don't know where the cameras are going to be at. I don't want to be caught looking at the camera or be caught open-eyed. That was just my preference. Rock did not commit a cardinal sin here. That was just his style. There's nothing wrong with that. We we each, when we go through the wherever place we're trained at, you know, in the big picture, everything's the same. In the little picture or the the way you put your spin on different moves is how you do that. So Rock had his eyes open during the cover. I think... You know, it, it was effective, but it could have been a little bit more effective had the eyes been closed to the television viewer. But no harm, no foul here. Let's get back to the match. And let me point out, as many times as the DDT is prostituted out to, in today's business, The Rock sells this thing on the backside with so much credibility, you know the DDT was a desperation kickout, and it definitely affected the physical wherewithal of the rock and took something out of his gas tank because of the damage that it supposedly inflicts further suspending your disbelief. Let's hit the play button. We're at nine minutes and 56 seconds play. Just rolls over. Here's Mick Earl buys a little bit of time. One, two big swings kick out by the rock with the left shoulder. That's what man breathes a sigh of relief. Here comes Mr. Sacco. Here comes Mr. Sacco. Get ready for the blind feed here. This is feeding an offensive move where you don't know where it's coming from. Well, you know where it's coming from, but you're just trusting the guy's going to be there for you. Blind feed right into Mr. Sacco. Watch, watch, watch the rocks. Right arm. He's hanging on to Mick for the base, using that left hand to flail to buy that crowd in. They got, I don't know, 15,000 people there. Bam! Ken Shamrock with an outstanding chair shot. Wham! Billy Gunn with a freight train on Ken Shamrock. Let's hit the pause button and talk about that for a second. Okay. Mick was about to win the match. Here comes Ken Shamrock with an outstanding time chair shot. Slides into an almost perpendicular position on the fly and whacks the hell out of Mick. Nice job, Ken. It was a vicious chair shot, perfectly placed, perfectly timed, and it had to be that way, uh, or the whole thing would have been botched. And here's on the back side of that, because that was interference on the corporation side for The Rock, saving the pinfall. Retribution had to be done by Degeneration X, who had allegedly adopted, basically, Mick Foley. Here comes Billy Gunn, like a freight train, and knocks the hell with just a flying tackle on Ken Shamrock. And this had to be executed in the fashion it was to fully, you know, make the sense of urgency was there because you're looking at a one, two, three, it's all over. Someone's going to have the championship, the other side. And so there's a sense of urgency in this match for the win. Ken Shamrock tried to pull it off with the chair. Here comes Billy Gunn. Frey trains him out of the ring. They go, they're in front of the table right here, the announce table, and we're setting up for the appearance of one Stone Cold Steve Austin. Now, this... This whole breakdown of this match was about the Stone Cold Pop that, that is about to happen at the 10.50 mark. Well, here's what happens, give or take around 10.50. I'm on 10.50 right now, and Billy Gunn is on top of Ken Shamrock for the announce table. Now, it wasn't all about Stone Cold Steve Austin. First of all, yes, I was very over, thanks to you people who bought in to the Stone Cold character. I gave you everything I had. But you look at everybody that's been involved in this match so far, look at the work with which Rock and Mick had put forth in this match. This match is is a pretty basic match when you look at the structure and the bumps and the pace at which they're working. They're working at a perfect pace. 
The bumps are vicious. They're selling everything. The announcers have made everything on the line. They've made Mick the complete underdog from a television standpoint, from an audience standpoint that's just watching there in the arena. The guys, uh, because they're so over and everybody's entrenched into the storyline, everybody has bought into it. So the way this is all played out, I'm about to hit the play button, and I'm going to hit full volume so you can hear the Stone Cold pop. Yeah, this is one of the best pops I ever got. Very gratifying. It's a feeling like no other feeling I can describe to you. So it wasn't all about me. It was the fact that, yeah, I was super over Rock, Mick, Work their asses off. Earl Hebner, you just got to understand how important that referee is in there, how he was able to get distracted and pulled in certain ways to never bury anybody or put heat on the boys or himself. It was outstanding timing. So let's go. Let me hit full volume here. I'm at full volume. I'm at 1050. I'm going to the play button, and we're going to listen to this pop. Back it up. Let's back that up. Holy smokes, everybody's going out there, damn man. Pandemonium has broke out. Looks like everybody had an ejector button on their damn t- chairs. I pick up the chair. Blind feet, wham. Chair shot into the rock. Chair shot into the rock. Let's back that up. Here I come. Back is going down a little bit. Back is going down a little Right to the chair. Watch this blind feet by the rock. 1109, 1109. Back it up. Let's go through 1109 one more time. Pick up the chair. I'm at 1058. Going through the paces. Coming down to the ring again. Coming down. Here I come. Let's hit a little bit of volume. Pick up the chair. Watch a blind feed by the rock. No hands. Straight chair shot. Pull back on the chair. Frog chair. Pull Mick over. Referee was distracted. Earl Hebner with the right hand count here. Two big pendulum swing. Pacing. Three count. Look at the hand signal. Look at the hand signal. Signals for the bell. Points down at the rock. Vince McMahon's going crazy. Watch. This is the use of props. Pause button. Pause button. 11 minutes and 29 seconds. Here's why I pause that. Working with props. I got a baseball cap on my head. Hey, man, I just noticed this. Swig of beer. Jim Dotson, who just passed away, is right in the background on my left-hand shoulder. Jim passed away about, shoot, a month or two ago. Uh, my respects to my old buddy Jim. I kept up with him uh, ever since I left the WWF. Me and Jim would stay in touch with text messages or whatever. I just noticed him standing there. He was always there. He got me out of many jams. Going back here. Let's go back to the match. Using the prop. I got a hat on my head. So what I'm thinking, Vince McMahon hates me. I hate him. Boss man is restraining him. Restraining him because Vince is not going to come at me anyway. It just adds to the allure and the hatred. I'm not going to go encroach on Vince because right now this is all about Mick and The Rock, and he just won the world championship. So uh, making use of a prop. I got a hat on my head. Hey, Let's use it. So that's why I threw my hat at Vince. That's why anytime I had the availability to use something, I would. I'd go out on a fence to use anything, whether it's rolling down a ramp in an office chair, standing up on props that are ringside, using chairs, hats, kicking a beach ball way back in the day. If there's something you can use to your advantage, walk on the rails, anything that you can do, Always keep that in mind, and it's part of the entertainment factor. It's a visual. So anyway, we're about to hit the play button. We're at 11 minutes and 29 seconds. Push and play now. Just threw the damn hat at Vince. Let's lay out the volume. There's DX. Boss man's pushing Vince back. There I am on the stage. Mick Foley got his hands raised. Earl Hebner raised his hand. He's got the gold belt. That gold is everything that the WWE is. You heard Michael Cole say that. Rock's selling, 
<laughs> Settle like crazy. Mick, China looks like a million bucks. There's me. Oh, hell yeah, from Stone Cold on the ramp. Double birds to Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon, God dang it, he's cussing me. Double birds right up there. Okay, here's the thing. We hit the ball, pause button at 12.08. I came, at, I came down. I helped Mick out. One chair shot to the rock. I got my stuff in, a couple of middle fingers, through the cab at Vince, and then get out of Dodge. Never, ever overstay your welcome. Leave, leave them wanting more than saying, hey, man, you've been out here long enough. Would you please go back? That's called trying to be a glory hound. Hey, man, once you've, once you've ramped them up, once you've hit the gas pedal and you hit 10,000 RPM, 10,500 RPM doesn't exist. They can't get that high. So you take it back down. And you go back to the back and you get out of uh, sight so the rest of the business can happen. Guy stays out there. The The point of this match was to make Mick Foley the world champion. So go down and do your thing, be effective, get your stuff over, get you over as a character, then get out of Dodge so all the credit and the glory and the respect goes to Mick Foley and respect to The Rock for bringing him a hell of a match, doing the favors. Hit the play button at the 12 web, 8 mark. Put in a little bit of sound here on one level. There goes Mick, climbing up to the top. There you go. Raise that belt up. Acknowledge the crowd. Mankind would become a three-time WWE champion. I don't know anybody in the business that down there is Ken Shamrock. Don't respect Mick Foley. Mick McMahon, he just doesn't know what to do. Here comes DX. They're going to pick Mick Foley up and came around. <laughs> this is not a point when I let me drop the volume, man. I thought Vince was at his strongest as, as far as a character. He was incredible back then. Road Dog, uh, who's doing a hell of a job running SmackDown right now, uh, great on the stick, is about to announce Mick as a world champion. Rock, devastated. There's Shayna Mack, who was a, a great performer in front of the crowd. X-Pac, who's been on the podcast before. Look, and there's, I wish Andrew Martin was still here. Look at that. Let's let's bring it in. All right, Mick's going to cut a promo here. Let me drop the volume out. He's going to reference his, uh, his, his two kids at the time at home. I think he's got more kids now. He's holding that belt near to his head. And let me tell you something. When I say that belt's a shoot, it is. That's a shoot for Mick right there, holding that belt. Anytime you get a chance to have that belt, it's a special time. Mick's still on the horn here. DX just kind of in the background doing a thing as China. China was super over, very dominant, uh, Hall of Fame. And all this happened, Billy Gunn has made use of a prop by bringing a chair into the ring, probably the same chair that I hit the rock with, and he's sitting in it. That's using a prop in the damn environment. Okay, match goes off the air at 1425. Check this out. This was uh, in a very special time in the business of pro wrestling. Damn near everybody there at ringside was a, a Hall of Famer. And a couple of people there are no longer with us. Uh, it was an awesome match. And I go back to uh, talking about that pop because that's why this whole podcast even started. And that's what I like about this podcast. Since it is a Steve Austin show, I can do whatever I want or talk about whatever I want. And I can sit here and break down a match and call that a show. And that's what I'm doing tonight. And it was because Zach sent in that email. And then I started watching this match. And it was like, holy smokes. I got to break this thing down because you look at the simplicity of this match. Look how hard those guys worked, but look how smart they worked. And look who worked too. They worked the crowd. Crowd was not working them. They didn't go to the crowd, dare I say, one time when Mick pulled the sock out. He acknowledged the crowd, brought them in, but there was no pandering there. The crowd was there the whole time because that's just the way it is. When you're on top, you're on fire, and you're over. You work the crowd. You ain't begging for nothing. There's a big difference. And so both guys, a lot of respect for both guys are my friends. Earl Hebner did a fantastic job 
uh, respect to all the members in the, in the ringside roles for doing what they did at perfect timing, damn near everything to perfection. And a big shout-out, man, uh, Michael Cole, probably some of the best work of his career. He's dispersing so much information now. I understand. It's a different ball ballgame. Uh, it, and it really is when you look at from 1999 into 2016. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way. I'm just saying with the app and with so much business to talk about, the dude is awesome at his job. Take a listen these days and realize how much information he's putting out, along with being totally into uh, you know all of the storylines which are going on at the time at which points he's got to get over. The dude is like Houdini. He's working magic out there. You sometimes, you know, surely you you miss the singular, you miss the singular focus and passion of Jim Ross, becoming so em, embroiled or enraged at the hill for doing despicable things or that backhanded compliments that he used to give Stone Cold. I don't know why they like him or Stone Cold, Stone Cold, Stone. You know, hell, he he helped build and make the Stone Cold character. And he's the one that invented the Texas Rattlesnake nickname. I didn't. But Michael Cole's doing a totally different thing uh, these days. It's dispersing a lot of information. The product has changed. But here, in 1999, I thought he was on fire. He captured the emotion. He captured the action. And with Jerry Lawler, was on fire, too. It was an awesome match. Anyway, it was all about a pop. And then it turned into all about a match about two badass friends of mine, The Rock and the one and only Mick Foley. Thank you for joining us for another classic episode of The Steve Austin Show. Please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends. For more Steve Austin Show, go to podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. Saddle up and get ready for Westerns Weeks on Pluto TV, all for free. We're coming in blazing with favorites like True Grit and Once Upon a Time in Mexico. Or immerse yourself in binge-worthy series like Yellowstone and Walker, Texas Ranger. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies, TV shows, and more. The best part? It's free. No credit card, no sign-up, no fees. Download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming now. Hey, this is Adam Carolla. Let me tell you about my podcast. We do it uh, every single day, so you can subscribe, and there'll always be a fresh one waiting for you. It's about two hours of uh, topics, topical topics, and news, and guests, and uh, comedians, and, of course, my own vitriolic take on uh, just about everything that's going on in the world. Plus... um, We get a lot of really interesting, uh, notable people who come in. We'll get politicians. We'll get uh, tastemakers. We'll get stand-ups. We'll get uh, authors. We'll get uh, pundits. We'll get, uh, 